Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. It's time for 2 Chronicles chapter 1 today on day 564 as we continue to make our way through God's Word. We're coming now to the kingship of Solomon at the beginning of 2 Chronicles and we're going to go through all the rest of the kings of Judah and Israel up until the deportation to Babylon and then the very end of 2 Chronicles tells us about the decree to restore Judah to the promised land. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help as we begin this second half of Chronicles together. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for not treating us as our sins deserve. Thank you for not losing patience with us as we are so prone to do ourselves with others. Your history of your people shows how patient and forgiving, how long-suffering and merciful you are. Stubbornness, rebellion, hard-heartedness, idolatry is met by you with loving confrontation and calls to repent and opportunities and offers of forgiveness and salvation and ultimately with the gift of your Son, our Savior. So help us to see Jesus and our need for him as we continue to make our way through Chronicles together. We pray that you bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 1, Solomon the son of David established himself in his kingdom, and the Lord his God was with him and made him exceedingly great. Solomon spoke to all Israel, to the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, to the judges and to all the leaders in Israel, the heads of fathers' houses. And Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the high place that was at Gibeon, for the tent of meeting with God, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, has, had made in the wilderness, was there. But David had brought the ark of God from Kiriath-Jerim to the place where David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem. Moreover, the bronze altar that Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, had made was there before the tabernacle of the Lord. And Solomon and the assembly sought it out. And Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tent of meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. In that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said to God, You have shown great and steadfast love to David my father and have made me king in his place. O oh Lord God, let your word to David my father be now fulfilled, for you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before this great people, for who can govern this people of yours which is so great? God answered Solomon, Because this was in your heart. And you did not ask for possessions, wealth, honor, or the life of those who hate you, and have not even asked for long life, but have asked for wisdom and knowledge for yourself, that you may govern my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are now granted to you. I will also give you riches, possessions, and honor, such as none of the kings had who were before you, and none after you shall have the like." So Solomon came from the high place at Gibeon, from before the tent of meeting to Jerusalem, and he reigned over Israel. Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen, whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. And the king made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stone, and he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore of the Shephelah. And Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt in Kiwi. And the king's traders would buy them from Kiwi for a price. They imported a chariot from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. Likewise, through them, these were exported to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. So this is Solomon's famous prayer for wisdom at the beginning of his reign. And yet, 
we also see at the very end of this opening chapter of Second Chronicles that while he was given wisdom and he exercised that wisdom, it was not a wisdom that was exercised in faithfulness to the word of God. We'll see that in, in a moment, even from the very beginning. Uh, Solomon's exercise of wisdom was not truly uh, according to the word of God and in the real fear of the Lord. So David had provided Solomon with all of this wealth and all of these material uh, possessions and everything needed for building the temple. And Solomon is now king and David has died and Solomon has to carry on with the work. We have a problem that's presented here in the beginning of Second Chronicles in that the tabernacle of the Lord the tabernacle that had been built under Moses and the altar of the Lord that had been built by Bezalel, this God-given worship place is at Gibeon. But the Ark of the Covenant, which was to be the center of the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the very presence of God on earth, that was in a different tent in Jerusalem. So you, in a sense, you had a split tabernacle, a split sanctuary. You had the tabernacle itself and the bronze altar and the other uh, furnishings of the tabernacle in Gibeon. And you have the Ark of the Covenant, the central most important piece in Jerusalem. Now, Solomon's charge is to build a temple in Jerusalem that will be a permanent home for everything to be brought together in the right worship of God. And David has made detailed plans for this as we went through in chapter after chapter at the end of First Chronicles. But, but Solomon, is he needs wisdom. He needs help. And so he goes and seeks the Lord, which is exactly the right thing to do. He goes to where the Lord's priest is and to where the Lord's tabernacle is and the Lord's altar is. And he seeks the Lord, which is exactly the right thing to do. And he asks for wisdom because he knows that he needs wisdom. The book of James in the New Testament tells us, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask it of God who gives freely to all without partiality. Uh, but don't ask so that you can spend it on yourself. And Solomon wasn't asking so he could spend it on himself. He wasn't asking for wisdom to figure out how to accumulate the most wealth or wisdom to figure out how to live a long life. He wanted wisdom to govern well. And Solomon did govern well. He increased the power and strength and stability of Israel on a human perspective, on a human level. But even though he was given this wisdom, which God was pleased to give him. And God was pleased to give him, uh, in addition to the wisdom and knowledge, riches and honor, such as no kings had had before him and none after would have. He has this unique place. However, God had, con had instructed the people of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy not to trust in chariots and horsemen, not to acquire, not for the king in particular, the king, not to acquire for himself many chariots and many horsemen, and specifically not to go to Egypt to look for chariots and horsemen. Because this is not walking in the fear of the Lord, even though he's walking wisdom and knowledge on a human level, and he's doing things that are wise and that are, that are shrewd, it's not a humble fear of the Lord because... He's accumulating 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen. He's importing them from Egypt. He's selling them to the nations around him. And so even before he builds the temple, there's this seed in Solomon's wisdom that will bear some bad fruit later in his reign. Thankfully, we do have a king who is greater than Solomon, who has greater wisdom and knowledge than Solomon, who has far greater faithfulness, then Solomon, he didn't trust in anything. In fact, at the end of his earthly life, when he died in faithfulness to God, he had nothing. He had absolutely nothing. Even the last stitch of his clothing had been taken from him, the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet no one was ever wiser. And, and now no one has a longer life or a greater kingdom or has seen more victory over their enemies than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so because Jesus sought faithfulness to his father and obedience to the word of God, even when it was hard, because that was his driving motivation, his central passion to do the will of him who sent him. 
to be faithful to the call of God his Father, because that was centrally important to him. God gave him resurrection life, eternal, a kingship that never ends, and ever-increasing victory over all of his and our enemies until that day when he comes again and reigns in glory forevermore. So we should be thankful for our greater than Solomon King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we have such a great king who is so wise and who is in himself the fulfillment of the tabernacle of God and who makes us into living stones of the living temple of God. Help us to be faithful to our heavenly king. Help us to desire faithfulness to you and to your word and to your son, to your gospel, to your kingdom, to your church, to your glory above everything else in our lives. There's so many things pulling for our attention. May you be first and foremost in our hearts and minds and lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that is Second Chronicles chapter 1. Tomorrow, Lord willing, we're going to go back to the book of Hebrews and pick up on Hebrews chapter 6, which is a difficult passage in God's word for sure, but we'll pray for the Lord's help in navigating our way through that chapter. That's on tap for tomorrow, Hebrews chapter 6. Lord willing, hope you can join me for that. As always, I do hope you have a blessed day in the Lord. Mm -hmm.